Hi, everyone. Welcome to our biweekly local peace economy uh, community call. Really happy to be here with you all. My name is Emily, and I'm the local peace economy coordinator at Code Pink. And most of you probably know Jody Evans, co-founder of Code Pink, is typically with us on these calls, but she couldn't be here tonight. Um, so I'll be leading the call. Um, but kind of like co co keeping the call with all of you um, as we connect into our grief um, tonight. Um, so I'll save announcements for the end, and I kind of just want to to drop right in um, as we often do with a piece of culture and a few breaths. So I'm going to read a poem tonight um, by Mark Nepo, if any of you are familiar. Um, but before I do, um, as always, I like to kind of get into my body a little bit. So I invite you to do the same. Maybe sit back in your seat, feel where your body is in contact with the ground or the seat below you, maybe behind you. I'm just going to take a few deep breaths into my belly, into my core. Just bringing back all my energy. Maybe you have been on a computer all day. Maybe you've been outside. Maybe you've been with people. Maybe you've been alone. But just kind of calling all your your energy back to yourself so that you can be present here tonight with yourself, with this collective. And this poem I have seen by a few names. Uh, sometimes it's just one of the lines of the poem, so I'm guessing it, it might not have a, a solid name, but that's okay. It can be fluid. Um, again, this is by Mark Nepo. Having loved enough and lost enough, I'm no longer searching, just opening. No longer trying to make sense of pain, but trying to be a soft and sturdy home in which real things can land. These are the irritations that rub into a pearl. So we can talk for a while, but then we must listen, the way rocks listen to the sea. And we can churn at all that goes wrong, but then we must lay all distractions down and water every living seed. And yes, on nights like tonight, I too feel alone. But seldom do I face it squarely enough to see that it's a door into the endless breath that has no breather, into the surf that human shells call God. Thank you all. Yeah, I, that poem came to me through a friend many years ago, and it, it came to mind tonight. Uh, it feels like it speaks to so many of the themes that we've been talking about, including grief which we'll be talking about tonight. Um, and also kind of connected to our um, our topic two weeks ago, which is connecting with the land and connecting with the earth. Um, and that'll be in the follow-up email. So, so before we dive into our topic tonight, um, I just wanted to welcome everyone, um, including those of you who may be new. And so if you're new, if you'd love if you we would love it if you'd introduce yourself and maybe share a little bit about what brought you here. And if you're not new, um, you're still welcome to introduce yourself and share a little bit about um, what you've been learning over these last several weeks, um, especially if you were here two weeks ago um, or have just been tapping in through the emails. Um, we'd love to hear what you've been learning about um, as you've been connecting with the land. Curious if anyone has been engaging any of the practices we kind of collectively gathered uh, two weeks ago, um, or yeah, just anything else that you're learning. And also just a reminder to please mute yourself if you're not speaking, just to minimize background noise. Thanks. Anyone wanna share? Leah. Hi, I'm Leah. Um, I think I'm new to this group, but not new to Code Pink. Um, and I see some friends here. Hello. <laughs> and um, thanks. So I, yeah, I just, I saw, you know, I've met Jody at some of our gatherings and I have the Peace Economy Handbook. Um, I'm here in Los Angeles on Chumash land at, and Tongva land. 
And um, so I want to answer your question in a couple, in, in a, well, you had a couple of questions, but one is what brings me here is the, is the topic of grief. Um, like this morning I woke up and I was like, I am, I am grieving. This is, you know, I'm really sad. It's so sad. Um, everything that's happening. And so to see your invitation to, you know, transform or, or to sit with our grief and build the new world peace economy, you know, that we can move into was really helpful for me. And so I'm so grateful to have the community. Um, and then um, with land, like connecting with the land, I want to say two things, which um, I think is related. I wasn't here two weeks ago, but this past weekend, I was spending some time by the ocean and in near Los Angeles, there's Topanga Canyon. If anyone's familiar with that. Yeah. And um, I, what, I don't know, how, it just was like serendipitous, but basically, oh, oh, I went into a store that had a book of the history of the land. And I learned that this parking lot that I was in was a sacred meeting place for the Chumash uh, Indians. And that Chumash actually came this far south and that there was an ancient burial ground um, that is now the PCH highway. And that these waters were like clean and medicinal that tribes as far from San Diego would come. And then reading the history, it was like, you know, some European European Americans arrived in the 19 in the teens and the 20s, excavated the sacred sites, you know, put the highway over. And by the 1950s, it was like a toxic dump of an old like auto mechanic store. And so I just was feeling like grief about how fast, you know, the desecration of the land has happened and like the power of, um, sorry, this light's on me, but like the power of the military to um, create this, like, and this, you know, and all over. Um, so like, I, and I live across the street. I, I'll finish by, I'll finish with a note of hope, um, but, uh, before I get there, I live across the street in Los Angeles from an active oil well. And today it was like making really sinister noises. Like it does some days, I guess it's drilling, you know, or pumping or whatever, but it just makes these noises. And now that I'm aware of what it is and like what it fuels, um, I'm really feeling the grief. And so I also just want to share the message of hope is that earlier I was connecting with um, an indigenous uh, teacher from Peru, from the Andes and the ancient Incan um, Caro Indian tradition. And they, um, they know we're gonna get to the place of rehabilitating the land, but that we're like not there yet. And um, just the gentle hope, like that we can connect with the land, with our prayers and um, and so, you know, what we're doing here in community is really powerful. It's really important. And it, it really does like, you know, uh, help us to create this beautiful new path. So I don't know, just thanks for holding my, holding space for me um, while, while I, we turn this grief into like, yeah, beauty. And thank you. <laughs> thanks, Leah. Happy to have you here. And yeah, you really spoke to another aspect of something that we talk about a lot here with the local peace economy is mapping with that parking lot and learning like the history of the place that you're living in and what that can teach you and where that can lead you in terms of cultivating peace economy. Oh, good. And I want to say that we spent yesterday afternoon cleaning up the trash that was all along this one beautiful part of the river. And so just doing that little bit, um, it actually made it look a lot more beautiful and, and you know, to give that respect to the land. Um, yeah, so I think I'm gonna carry a trash bag with me and like make it a habit to pick up trash. Maybe I'll get one of those like grabbers. <laughs> Love that. Uh, Greg. I just uh, thought that um, the uh, connection with the land, I have not done real well with it in some ways, but I was, I've been working on this house, uh, our, our house, and it was built about 120 years ago. And 
it's literally made out of the land. It's adobe. And um, so I've been digging into these walls that are sort of, they've got a problem because there's a garden outside. And so people for a hundred years, people have been watering this garden and the water gets into the wall. I'm just finding things like these little rocks and stuff. And I go, they put the land into their house. You know what I mean? They put the land into their house. They're living in a house that is the land. It's just, it, it kind of, it's a different thing to me. That's really cool. Thanks for sharing that, Greg. Yeah, I've been actually um, just reflecting on something very similar. I was actually just in Taos, um, New Mexico, and I went to Taos Pueblo, which is the indigenous community, for those of you who don't know, Taos. And um, yeah, to see all the adobe houses, and it just felt so different, you know, from the house that I live in, and there are like no straight edges, like it just I don't know. I'm just, I've been sitting with that. So thanks for, for sharing that. John, did I see your hand raised? Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask Leah. Uh, I, uh, I moved here to Boulder from Los Angeles in uh, 1999. And uh, I'm 86. When I was a child, uh, the smog actually had a brown color to it. Uh, I was glad that it was turning more blue. Uh, I'm wondering, um, is is there more rail rat for transit now in Los Angeles than there was uh, uh, in the late 90s? Yes, yeah, they just extended the the metro like subway, um, and they're expanding it more. I was really impressed. They put up this extra subway line pretty quickly too, like around two. I don't know, was that two? 2014, I think, um, or actually, like, yeah, yeah. So there is, there are blue skies here. Thank goodness. I've heard stories about what it used to be like, and again, like, this is awesome to see that it's possible to clean, right? It's possible to have a clean community. It's not that hard, I, and that makes me think of how much energy it takes to create pollution. It's such a waste of energy to create pollution. Oh my God. <laughs> Thanks, Leah. Anyone else want to share or introduce themselves before we dive deeper into tonight's topic? Joe? Um, I <clears throat> unexpectedly experienced a huge wave of grief this morning uh, when I uh, dove into the what's going on in Lebanon right now. And <clears throat> I was grateful that I have established for myself practices, meditation practices, and also um, I'm reading some some books on on one one is by Frijaf Capra. I wanted to mention this book. It's it's called. There's a series. He's a theoretical physicist who has uh, linked physics and the intuitive sense in ways that are have been very helpful. I've I've been reading and studying him for about six seven years now, and. Um, the other book, <laughs> for those who love music, especially jazz, is a book by uh, Stefan uh, Alexander called The Jazz of Physics. And I think that what I'm finding in these wonderful sessions, uh, Code Pink sessions as well, is the uh, relatedness and the parallels that we're finding in different territories that were once separate is is a very helpful it's very helpful on our path to understanding where we are and what we can do um i'm i'm grateful for the ceasefire rally that we have and for other areas of consciousness that are emerging in the city where i live peterborough ontario thanks 
Thanks, Joe. Hmm. Well, that was kind of a great, a great segue into, um, yeah, diving deeper into tonight's topic, which is grief, which we've kind of already opened that up with some of our shares. Um, and as some of you have named, we're witnessing this escalating violence in Lebanon over the past week, and we're approaching one year since October 7th. And so as I was thinking about this and thinking about this week's call, my intuition kept pulling me back into this topic of grief for tonight's call to give space to name our grief, to explore our grief, and to hold our grief together. And we might have a variety of feelings arising right now, not just grief, or maybe grief doesn't feel super present for us right now, and that's okay. This isn't about um, forcing ourselves to feel anything. But we wanted to give space for touching into grief tonight because grieving is part of the work, as we've talked about um, previously, if you've been with us, um, that's necessary to grow our local peace economies. We recognized this really early on um, in this work of the local peace economy work, um, that grief is going to arise because our lives have been used and are continuing to be used by the war economy. And that's not only infuriating, but it's also deeply heartbreaking when we let ourselves feel that. It's heartbreaking to know that our, li our lives um, are being used to carry out violence around the world. Our tax dollars are going to weapons and bombs, as we all know. So as we separate ourselves from the war economy and pivot to a local peace economy, we're going to have to feel a lot, which can be scary. Um, but we're going to have to feel a lot because we're coming back to ourselves and all the feelings that the war economy numbed in us. So that's why we created the cycle of reconnection as part of this local peace economy work. And if you're not familiar with that term, the cycle of reconnection, you can find more about it in the local peace economy workbook and on the peace economy website and i'll share those links and announcements at the end of the call and they'll be in the follow-up email so don't worry about that too much right now but so um let's begin by welcoming our grief and witnessing our grief um i think we've already started to to do that actually in the shares already but grief needs to be witnessed and we can do that together tonight so we'll begin by sharing and i'll put this in the chat what have you had to grieve as, as you've done this work? And the encouragement here is to speak about griefs that are close to you rather than what's happening in Palestine and Lebanon and around the world. Um, that is grief that we all share and that's not to deny or diminish that grief and the importance of tending to it at all. We need to do that for sure. But just for our space tonight, um, let's focus on what we ourselves have had to feel in our own lives because that's where we can root ourselves and ground ourselves and start to um, move from and move towards what we are in relationship to in our community from that place. So I will put this in the chat. And yeah, we'll just continue the open sharing. So feel free to raise your hand or pop off mute. What are the griefs that you felt as you've done this work to pivot away from the war economy to a peace economy? And perhaps a, an entryway into this question too, if you've been working with the pivots, if there's one specifically that you've been working with, if grief has come up around that pivot, um, that's one way to enter into this question of many. Tim. Go ahead, Tim. Oh, I have to unmute myself. Uh, you know, one thing uh, that grieves me, I'm in the uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, and at one time, especially here in Los, in San Jose, there was a lot of agricultural land. And more re recently, Amazon has come in and bought a bunch of this land and built these huge warehouses on it. So every time I drive by this, where once they were growing corn and had animals grazing, I really grieve. But what kind of makes me hopeful, we had this book review with Jody on, uh, was it Sunday night, I believe it was? And she was talking about a group of farmers out in the San uh, Joaquin Valley somewhere that are a bunch of regenerative farmers that are... Uh, regenerating thousands of acres out there. So that kind of makes me hopeful that we can stop this land destructive policies 
we have going on right now and changing from destroying the earth to healing the earth. Thanks for sharing, Tim. Anyone else like to share? Joy. Hello. <laughs> um. I, I, I have a podcast and I report on local government stuff. And you've reminded me that, uh, that uh, talking about losing the farmland and stuff like that, that uh, one thing that, that always tears me up when I'm reporting on, like particularly the county commission and what they're up to, uh, uh, um, oh, our city's growing. Uh, which already makes me unhappy, you know, because it's just eating up the whole county and I, uh, we're going to be in the next state pretty soon. But um, they, uh, they, they, they put, they, they'll put a display up of where it is that they're talking about annexing it. And, and, and th they put a color, they put a color over the part of the land that they want to, that they're talking about. This is where we want to annex. So you can't even see what's there. Nobody talks about what's already there at all in the conversation. It kills me that I can't even see what's there to say, don't, don't develop that forest. Don't develop that farmland. There's a stream running through there. What are you going to do about it? I, they put a color on top of it. And then they, then they, you know, later on after they've done gone through planning and whatever they've decided they want to do, they name these subdivisions things like um, uh, the Robbins Cove or uh, you know Five Creek Acres, you know stuff like that. They name the subdivisions after like Cliff Farms, uh, after the things that used to be there, as if they that made it okay, you know. That upsets me. Can I just mm -hmm. say that that really, they don't even talk about what's there or even look at it. It's all, okay, anyway, uh, that's, I'll, I'll let it, I'll let you go. <laughs> Thank you for listening. It's funny you say that, that Amazon property is now called McCarthy Ranch after the, the ranch was there. <laughs> Talk about mapping. Yeah. Mm. I'm feeling moved to share um, something that I've had to grieve and continue to grieve is I've done a lot of more intentional work over the last year to, yeah, reconnect with the earth and deepen my relationship with the land. And there have been many moments where I'm just like, I have no clue what I'm doing. And that is intentional. And that has been because I have been cut off from those traditions that, and my lineages that were connected with the land at some point. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I learned from teachers, um, but, I've had to grieve like the amount of labor it takes um, because I am so separate from it in my day-to-day -day life in the war economy culture um, to, to learn those ways and to even like learn um, what my intuition is saying and like, is this my intuition? Is just, this just like deep conditioning of the war economy? Like, yeah, still trying to, to learn all of that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a, a piece that I've had to grieve in this, in this work. And if there are, feel free to continue to share your grief either in the chat um, 
and there'll be space in the breakout rooms. But I also, I wanted to open up one more question before I move into the breakout rooms, which is um, grief can feel all consuming and yet it's also part of love. Um, and it moves us towards what matters to us. Francis Weller, um, who wrote uh, an incredible book about grief um, called, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on it right now. I'll, if someone knows it, please put it in the, wow, it just blew out of my head. Um, please put it in the chat. And, um, but he says that grief and love are sisters. He talks about them being intertwined. So as we name our grief, um, I wanted to open up space for us to also name our joys and our tethers and anchors, our sources of connection to life. So if anyone would like to share, um, what's filling you up right now? What's keeping you tethered to your commitment to serve life as we do this work? And again, I'll put that in the chat. Wild edge of sorrow. Thank you, Ali. I was like, I think sorrow's in there somewhere. I kept thinking of the five gates of grief, which is something that he talks about in that book, but I knew that wasn't the title. Um, anyone like to share their, what's filling them up, giving them joy, keeping them tethered? Yeah, hi, and, um, Andy. this is Andy. How are you guys this evening? Um, I was gonna actually share um, one of my, there, there's been so much grief with everything that's going on, but I was gonna share something personal that I've been grieving that has then led to joy and that keeps me tethered. And for me personally, I've been grieving a lot of my um, over-consumerism, my mindless consumerism, my role in the war economy being a consumer, um, an over-consumer, a mindless consumer. And so just really um, recognizing that, grieving that and pivoting from it to be a conscious, more mindful consumer, a lesser consumer, and being more um, hands-on. Like I'm, I make a lot of our food now. I'm enjoying the process and the the real ingredients and the love that goes into that. Um, and then just really finding things like I don't ever want to buy this again. What can I do so that we don't consume this? And just really um, having conversations with friends and family, encouraging them to, to do the same. And you can make such minor changes um, that can have big profound um, impacts on your day to day. Um, but it brings me a lot of joy. I make sourdough bread, um, never was someone in the kitchen and find a lot of joy in making sourdough bread for my friends and family and then taking it to them um, and, and then making all kinds of other things as well. But that's been a part of my journey. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, yeah, there's so much coming up for me and I won't share it all just for the sake of time, but um, I put this in the chat. I hear a lot, I hear you speaking to, I don't know if this is something you've been intentionally working with, but the pivot of consumption to creation, like very, um, deeply there so that's really really cool thanks for sharing that leah thanks um yeah i'd love to share again like um on this question so also like the grief right before this call started i heard a loud explosion like um in my neighborhood like somebody just let off a big firecracker but like one of those bomb type things and and so like that that makes my body feel like it's in danger um but like nobody's reacting to it I guess I guess it was just a firework so I, on this um pivot from I see like pivot from reactionary to investigative um and so I can do some breath work and instead of like reacting with like real anger that somebody's exploding fireworks and I think I heard like you know a bird scream like there was something that made me really sad hearing that um I and also like I'm also grieving how a neighbor was using roundup um near my property line after I asked him not to like because I grow I try to grow food that I can eat um and I've just there's like a limitation to to what I 
what I, how I can protect myself, right? Like these things are in my environment. I can't control my neighbor <laughs> or someone nearby exploding fireworks. But what I can do is like, um, somehow, <laughs> I don't know, you know, somehow just like breathe and be like, this. I guess at some level, those, those people think that they're doing something good, you know, or like someone's having fun exploding that firecracker. And that I just have to like, anyway, I don't know, I guess I'm still working on it, but trying to find um, a feeling of security when, when all of this degradation is happening. A lot of trees have been cut in my, in my neighborhood in the city. And um, sometimes I get in between, you know, sometimes I'll, if I catch it happening, I'll speak up for the trees. And that's felt good when I've had success. Um, but I think to to ground myself, uh, as the second question asks, um, what's filling me up and what's keeping me tethered is that I, is that like, there's still beauty, like the force of nature is still living and alive. And it's really just this human ignorance that's, cre you know, that's like in enclosing us in the sort of, you know, war economy. Um, anyway. Thanks for holding space. Yeah, so filling me up is seeing that nature is still vigilant. Um, I love when I hear the hummingbirds fly through. Um, I was really sad because that neighbor with the Roundup had cut some of my trees and there was like a hummingbird nest. And anyway, the hummingbirds are back. Like they didn't leave forever. And um, we had some butterflies uh, hatch, like, you know, metamorphosis size from the caterpillars into beautiful yellow swallowtail butterflies. And I was like, you know, that's, that's like significant, you know, nature is still um, really strong. So that's keeping me grounded. Thanks. Thanks, Leah. And yeah, I love that you use the word vigilant to talk about nature, just because I just happened to hear on a podcast recently, someone, could, maybe this is obvious to everyone else, but um, someone just connected that word for me, the word vigilant with the word vigil and like holding vigil. Um, and so there's something about that image of like nature holding vigil, um, and how can we hold vigil, um, for the earth, um, as part of our grief work. Um, well, I just got goosebumps. That was, that's, that's powerful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sparking that. Um, okay. So thank you all so much for your shares and we're going to move into our breakout rooms now. I know we've done a lot of sharing, but it'll be a little bit more, more intimate and personal there. And I'll put some um, questions in the chat and, you know, we've talked a lot about the things that we're grieving right now um, and the things that are bringing us joy and also like talking about them is not necessarily the act of grieving and we need practices and rituals for grieving and it's a process. So that's what these questions are kind of touching into a little bit more about that grieving process. And in the follow-up or in the um, in the email that went out earlier this week, I just gave one example of a practice um, that comes from Trisha, Trisha Hersey um, called the grief jar, um, which is basic. I mean, there's a little bit more to it, but, and you can read about it, but basically, it's the practice of having a jar in your home or somewhere that you frequent with some pieces of paper next to it. Um, and that you can, every time you have something to grieve, you can write it on that jar or write it on a piece of paper and put it in the jar. And then you can decide what to do, um, you know, with the papers in that jar, if you want to burn them or um, something like that. But um, again, there's more explanation in the, in the email and on our website, but but yeah, just just opening that up to to talk about the grieving process and like the, the actual labor of mourning, um, the things that we're naming. So the questions for the breakout rooms are: um, Do I feel supported in my grieving process? What do I need to be supported in touching into my grief? And what have I learned from my grief or from the grieving process? So I'll put y'all in the breakout rooms. Um, and we'll have about 15 minutes. So please just keep time for yourselves. Make sure everyone um, gets a chance to speak. And let's see. I think we'll do about 10 breakout rooms. And if 
people don't join or whatever, I might move you around. So just don't be alarmed, but just, and we'll see you back. Back everyone. And just a reminder to please put yourself on mute when you come back. <laughs> Minimize all the feedback. I hope those were juicy conversations. Just gonna give everyone a few moments to, I think the minute just ended because we just got a flood of people back in. Welcome back everyone, <laughs> like a cascade. Um, welcome back. Uh, I hope that felt supportive and connective. Um, just a reminder to please put yourself on mute if you're not already there um, for our large group shares. And yeah, we'll just um, share out anything you want to share from your conversation. Um, yeah, Tim, I, Leah accidentally left the room early and wanted to hear what you had to say. So if you're willing to share what you were speaking um, about with a large group, you're, I'll, you're welcome to. Um, and if not, then maybe if you're willing, you could um, private message Leah as well. But um, she mentioned that. Yeah, Tim, if you're willing, I was just curious what you were going to say. Uh, I, I, we were talking about the indoctrination. Where did we leave off? I kind of. Yeah, it was like, so I really respect that you have this perspective being a veteran yourself and you're sharing about the indoctrination and how, how to get through to people who really, you know, don't see out of the war economy. And, um, and then I, I shared how I went to Gettysburg and learned that like General Lee made the choice not to retreat his men and to let tens of thousands of his young men get slaughtered. Um, and so like, what is it about old patriarchs, like war leaders or war mongers that just see, you know, lives as expendable? And um, you're going to say something about that. Yeah, you hear it all the time. The honor, my honor uh, demands satisfaction type of thing you know so his honor overcame his judgment really and i you see that all the time i i, I think that's what it's in israel and palestine now america's honor is at stake what honor to kill people so we use that front as an excuse thanks tim yeah Anyone else want to share what was coming up in their conversation about what they need in their grieving process, what you've learned from your grieving process? Kathy. Well, um, Joe it was in the group with me, and one thing, she, I was talking about the Democratic Party, how my views on the Democrats are so different now. And, um, you know, it's a tough choice ahead in uh, November. But um, she mentioned the words uh, learning in unlearning so um that's that's caught me um and i'll hold on to that thanks for sharing yeah so much unlearning so much unlearning so much unlearning <laughs> and you know it's hard it's hard work it's so hard we also <laughs> kathy and i also talked about that i mean you have to have Sympathy for those people who maybe don't have the resources or for whatever reason. And and they've got, like Tim was saying, they're hanging on to something like the honor because they have not got the strategies. Of the, it's not that they don't have the capacity. It, they're just no mindset for thinking things through and feeling your way through to other possibilities. That's the problem. Victoria? Yes, in our group, we we had a we really person uh, talked personally about it in terms of uh, friendships that have been lost and have changed, and where there is now silence, where maybe before you could openly communicate, and that a lot of my friends were are my big community sense of community, and so losing those friendships. Um, it creates a lot of sadness, a lot of anxiety, a lot of for me in the beginning, it was self doubt. It was like, do I actually know what I'm talking about? And I, I did the more I educated myself and the more I attended group sessions like this, but it was, it's been a really eye opening experience to see that there are things 
in now that you can I mean, you could talk more freely about politics, but war and this war in particular, there's so much silence. And I remember in the beginning just wanting to talk to specifically my Jewish friends. I wanted to hear their point of view and they would not talk about it. And that felt even more isolating. So I think that a lot of grief too is around how relationships have changed. So. Thanks for sharing that, Victoria. Yeah, that's really, really poignant. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. John? Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, uh, to uh, uh, that uh, there is uh, an organization in the United States, maybe you're aware of, Jewish Voice for Peace, and there are a lot of a lot of people who are are part of that. So it's it there's controversy, uh, considerable controversy within Judaism. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. Um, Jeff, you want to share with Andy, and then I think that'll be our last share for the evening. Um, I was mentioning uh, Leah had left our our group, but uh, I was mentioning it to Tim. Check out. Um, this is a TED talk from about 10 or 12 years ago. It's called Israel and Iran, I Love You. Uh, it's a TED talk. And uh, this graphic artist in Israel held up his daughter and took a picture of he and his daughter holding up an Israel and um, Iranian flag back in the days when there was a, a more saber rattling between Israel and uh, Iran. But it's it's really a neat video what they did and how it went viral. This is from about twelve years ago. Anyway, Iran and Israel and Iran, I love you. Thank you and thank you, Leah, for putting it in the chat, and I'll put it in the um, follow up email too. Um, but yeah, with that, I think we're coming to the top of the hour. And before we all head off, I wanted to just share some announcements. Um, just bear with me as I, there's a lot of them, so I'll put them in the chat. Um, and it always copies and pastes funny. So just give me one second. Um, if you are regular on these calls, a lot of these will look familiar to you. Um, a lot of these are resources to go deeper into this work, like the website and the workbook. But two that I specifically want to highlight, um, two of these announcements. In the last two here, we have a couple um, local peace economy events coming up um, outside of these biweekly calls. The first one is on uh, October 1st, which is next Tuesday, I believe, and we're starting monthly local peace economy learning hours. Okay. So these spaces are spaces to connect and reflect, um, but we wanted to create another space too to bring in people um, doing local peace economy work to be a more educational space where we can ask them questions so people can learn what the local peace economy actually looks like in practice. Um, if you have some like questions about that. So our first one is gonna be all about co-op. Mm -hmm. um, and so that'll be Tuesday. And I'm really excited about our speaker. Her name is, she goes by Sassy. Um, and I met her through the New Economy Coalition and she has um, a history of both uh, co-op organizing and anti-war organizing. So I think she'll really be able to speak to the intersection of um, why why co-ops are part of work, like peace work. Um, so I'm really excited about that. So hope to see you there. Um, the link is there in the chat and as well as on the 15th. Um, on the 15th, um, we're having our first local or our first peace economy writing workshop, which is um, something that uh, a woman named Michelle, um, who's been on these calls with us before, came to us and wanted to offer um, for writers. She said she's a writer and she's been in spaces and she's brought work talking about peace, talking about peace economy culture that wasn't necessarily like met with a lot of warmth in other <laughs> virtual uh, work, uh, writing workshops or in-person writing workshops. Um, so she wanted to create a space for people um, all are welcome. You don't have to necessarily identify as a writer, um, but to be able to connect and um, share their work, get feedback, it could be poetry, it could be essays, it could be short stories. Um, there's more details in the link there, um, but we're super excited about that. Um, so that'll be the first 
um, of a monthly uh, series for that as well. And if you know of any writers in your life, feel free to share that with them too, if you think they'd enjoy it. Um, and with that, I will say good night. Please email me if you um, need anything or have any questions and um, we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night.